Let's turn to Psalm 1. Um, Sister, Sister Anne arrived this morning and says, what are you preaching on this morning, brother? I said, I'm just going to preach on the same. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to keep preaching the same until either I change, you change. Um, isn't that how it's supposed to be? Are we supposed to just continue to, 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 to drive the nail with the hammer uh, until we all see it and we, and we all progress in the Bible way? Amen? And, and so we're just going to continue. And uh, um, uh, something like that. It's, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, uh, um, some of you have got it. Some of you are getting it. And uh, I pray that at some point the penny will drop for all of us. Praise the Lord. And what, are getting it? <laughs> um, amen. So yeah. So yeah. So just no, notice I have changed the title, though, haven't I? So that's at least something. Um, yeah. Um, praise the Lord. Um, well, yeah. Let's just go to the Book of Psalms, Psalm one, and and, and let us see where. Uh, uh, we end up today, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also, or his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Wow, that sounds pretty good to me, doesn't it? Whatever you put your hand to, uh, it shall prosper. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, we, we covered a lot last week. And, and I believe that we were fed very, very well. In fact, if we don't get past last week, we, we're really wasting our time. Uh, we really need to have a born-again experience. If you do not have that moment, as, as uh, Paul mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said, you know perfectly the day of the Lord. If you do not know perfectly your day in the Lord, uh, um, you, you're getting there. You may be enlightened, you uh, may be uh, uh, um, uh, heading in the right direction, but you're not yet born again. I believe that each one of us here could testify, those who are truly born again, can testify that their new birth or you were birthed in a crisis. And that's just how it is. You know, uh, our sister's going to learn in, 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 a, in a, maybe a week or two uh, that that baby will come in a moment of crisis. And that's just how birth is. Birth comes in a crisis. And, and if you have not been born again in a crisis situation, I very much doubt that you have what the Bible says you should have. Amen? And uh, so each one of us, therefore, as Paul said, remembers the moment. And I would presume this morning that most of the women here who have given birth remember the moment. Uh, and and uh, you might not know the exact time, the hour, uh, but... Uh, you know. True? Would, would that be correct? <laughs> Amen. And, and so new birth is exactly the same thing. You may not know the exact, you know, the, the, the exact date, the exact uh, uh, those parts, but you do know the moment. And uh, praise God, if you have that experience, you're on your way. Amen. You have started well. The second thing we discussed last week and saw clearly where most people fail, most who are born again fail, is they refuse to renew their minds. They might study to renew their minds, but they do not put that learning into practice. We must practice the life and that our study, that our renewed mind brings forth. And if we don't do that, well, we, we are in a very sad state. And of course, we discussed that we're not going to actually put what God shows us into practice unless we exercise discipline. Amen. We have to make choices between the way of the flesh, the way of the world, 
and the way that God calls us to walk. And many times it is the exact opposite. Amen. Your flesh wants to do one thing. Your flesh wants to please in one way. But God says, that's not what I want you to do. Amen. And so uh, those are the three things. We waste our time unless we're born again. We waste our time if we do not renew our mind in life and put it into practice. And of course, we'll never put what God says into practice unless you make the choice to do so. And that takes discipline. It's going to go against the grain. Amen. You're going to have to flow upstream. It's just how it is. You have to swim upstream. And, and some of you know what I'm talking about because you've had to make difficult choices, uh, choices that you really did not want to make, but you knew under the conviction of God you had to make those choices. Amen. They weren't easy. They may have affected other people uh, to what appears to be their harm or their hurt uh, or their relationship with you may have been broken or fractured in some way because of the choices you make. But you need to decide whose relationship you want to fraction. Your friends or God. Amen? That's kind of how it is, isn't it? And, and uh, um, that's just how it is. Amen? Now here uh, in this Psalm 1 <clears throat> that we refer to as the doorkeeper or the gatekeeper Psalm. Uh, and of course, uh, number one, it's obviously a call to salvation. Amen? That's the most important thing. There's no point preaching or talking about separation unless we are first born again. See, there are many who try and put the cart before the horse and call people to separation when they're not yet properly born again. And that's how we end up with hard holiness and, and all those things, and even some of the things that people accuse us of, that we're simply doing what we're doing because that's what we're told to do. Or that's what we believe you know, uh, God has commanded us to do. And that's just the wrong attitude. And if you're in that ship or in that boat this morning, you're just in the wrong place in God. Amen. Not in the wrong place being here, but in God you're in the wrong place. Amen. Uh, now that's the kind of the Pharisee attitude, wasn't it? You know, I have to do, do, do it this way because uh, you know, that's what the law says. But when Jesus saw them, he said, he said, look, uh, he told them, look, why did sepulchres? I mean, they're just, they're just tombstones. And of course, what's in a tomb? Dead man's bones. Inward, just dead man's bones. They may appear to be doing the right thing. They were tithing. They were fasting. Uh, they were doing all the things that the law commanded them to do to the letter. But the problem was the love was not in it. Amen. They were doing it just as you do a job. So when we talk about discipline, you must understand the difference between needing to do something and wanting to do something. That's the important key, isn't it? You've got to, you know, a lot of people feel they need to do something, but that's not what God requires from us. He wants you to want to do something. Amen? So there is an area there uh, that, that, that only you know. Amen? Because um, you could kind of say, well, you know, discipline is, is what I need to do. But I, I realize that's true to an extent. Amen. But in truth, it's the wrong discipline. You are disciplining yourself because inwardly you want to do something. Not because outwardly the book says. Do you get the difference? That's why you must be born again. Because when you are born again, what comes in? The love of God. Amen. The love of God. Well, the Spirit, yes, but the Spirit of God is love. So what comes in us is the love of God or love for God. And that's the key, isn't it? So if you don't have that moment, if you don't have that moment, you feel like you need to do. And that's just wrong because you're going to struggle with that and become very despondent and eventually you just slip out. Whereas if you are born again, there's something within you that wants to. And it's that want to that you need to discipline. True? And that's the difference. It's the only way I can explain the difference. I mean, because out on, because on the surface, it just appears exactly the same. And that's why some of you who are doing things because you want to do it, because God is telling you in your inward being that that's what he requires from you, you want to do it, amen. But, and, and then there are other people who just do it because it's the appearance of doing it. And of course, those who are outside the kingdom look upon that. And I'm talking about people in Babylon who are outside the kingdom. They, they, they just tar both with the exact same brush. Because that's all they see. Amen? So this need to and want to is very difficult to 
discern or, or to see the difference. But you know. You know because you have had that experience. You are born again. Amen? And so that is within you. True? True? Amen? So, um, following, you know, when, when again, when I look at Psalm 1, I see first of all we must be born again. And then we see that as part of our born again experience, or the flow on is separation. The flow on is separation. It's like you know, God is saying to us, look, you cannot separate until you have the power within you to separate. Amen? You have to have the power within you. Or you have to see the benefit within you. See, I, see when, like when I see Psalm 1 here, it says, you know, blessed is the man, happy is the man, rejoicing uh, is the man. Uh, uh, um, I see that. It reminds me a lot of Psalm 103. Where, where David says, uh, "Bless the Lord, O my soul," and he said, "And and and all that was all that is in, all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits." They might seem like they are different, but they're exactly the same. Notice they're opposites, and we are talking about a person who's blessed of God, and and somebody who 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 who, who is seeking the blessing. But the ultimate thing is that in separation there is blessing. In separation there is blessing. And again, unless you are born again, you will not see it. You'll see it as something hard, something difficult, something uh, uh, that's making your life miserable. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen? You begin to look at, your, at the way you dress or the way you look or compared to the way the world looks. Amen? Especially when you get a bit, when you get a bit old, you look in the mirror and you see the wrinkles and you see the grey hair and you see, you know, and, and you know, just a little touch up, just a little bit of makeup, a little bit of blush, a bit of something else. You Amen? Know, just a bit of tone or whatever. Uh, I feel like I use the stuff, hey? <laughs> Amen. Will, will, will uh, just make me feel so much better or make me look so much better? And what's the harm in that? What is the harm in that, we could say? Well, physically there's no harm at all, except you might be poisoning yourself. I, I don't know. Amen. But physically you are doing no harm, but spiritually you are. Because you're giving in. Amen. You're giving in to the flesh. You're giving in to the temporal. And you've lost sight that the reality is the spiritual. Amen? Isn't that true? So you are lacking discipline. That's the problem. Amen? And, and, and uh, many, many a time, uh, I believe that, that the problem goes right back to the for sure. To the for sure. Amen? If you're feeling you know, despondent about the way you are or what you have to do as a Christian, I believe there's something wrong in the initial building block. I think uh, was it uh, Paul who was talking about you know uh, the found the foundation and what we build on there you know, hay and stubble. He said you know uh, uh, we need to be careful that we do not build hay and stubble on a good foundation. And when you start to feel like you uh, are now doing things out of a need to because I have to keep up my Christian appearance, you need to go back somewhere. Maybe you need to go back to the moment. And remember the moment and, and remember why you were saved and why you gave your heart to Christ. And that's why, why I say many times that everybody I know who is truly saved were born again in a crisis. They knew what they were saved from. They were probably in a stage of their lives where their back was against the wall. Amen. And it was, and they knew in their heart of hearts, they knew in their heart of hearts if they continued the way they were, it was going to end up bad, really bad. Amen? Uh, their family broken up, uh, whatever. Amen? They're, they're themselves, harming themselves. Uh, you know, just come to the, to, to, the, to the end of the rope, so to speak. Amen? And most of us who were born again were at that stage. We were at the end. We could go no further. We were, we were between a rock and a hard place. And if you just go back to that rock and that hard place, and remember where you were, it might shake you out of your, well, you know, do I have to do this? <laughs> you begin to see what God did for you. Amen? And you begin to realize that not only did He want to take you out from where you were in the mire, so to speak, 
He said, uh, if you come out, I'll give you some benefits. Now what he promised, I'll give you some benefits. But the benefits can only be realized in separation. Amen? Can only be realized there. Um, you see, it is my belief that we can very easily turn new birth into a curse. If you are born again or testify to being saved, born again, and you're not happy, it has become a curse to you. It has become a drudgery to you. Amen. It's become a noose around your neck. It's almost like you're too afraid to give it up. I mean, your salvation. Yeah, it, 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 it reminds me of the spirit of fear. I think people are, people are like that sometimes. They, they continue to profess their Christianity, but their heart is no longer in it. And the problem is they may have been saved, but now they have allowed salvation to become a curse to them. Amen. And what kind of life is that? Can you imagine having to testify as to being a Christian? Testify to being saved. Amen. In, in the vain hope that God might overlook and still get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. But my salvation, my walk on the earth is one of drudgery, one of, you know, uh, boy, I've got to do this, and boy, I've got to do that, and, and boy, every time I hear preaching, I'm under conviction, and blah, 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 blah. That's a curse, is it not? You know, what we're preaching about, amen, uh, myself, yourself, we should rejoice in that and say, amen, that is my life. But I feel that it's not completely our lives. Some of you may be. But I don't think everybody here is happy being saved. I mean, happy as we sung this morning. Glad. Would have it no other way. Amen. But some of us are, would, would just like a little bit there and a little bit here. Amen. We're not really truly separated from God. That is most miserable. That's where we become disillusioned. That's where the backsliding starts. Amen. We know what we should do. Or we do it because we need to, but I don't really want to. And that's a curse. That's a curse. That's, that's just an albatross, if you like the old sailor, an albatross around your neck, so to speak, isn't it? Eventually that beast, that dead thing's going to kill you. True? So, you know, I, you know Paul put it like this in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Because don't think, don't think that, self, self, that salvation, um, how's it going to put it? is the end of it all. You know, salvation has a power to bless, but a power to curse. We must remember, you know, that's what the, mess, that's what the gospel is, isn't it? They that believe shall be saved. They that believe not, in other words, put in practice what God says. Remember, that's what faith is, isn't it? I believe what God says. To them, it's damnation, or to them, it is a curse. And we can bring that on ourselves, as Paul said here in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Um, when I find it. Hebrews 10 and, and uh, verse 23. He says, uh, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he's faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love, and to good works, not saying the assembling together of, uh, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and as much the more as we see the day appearing, or the day approaching. For if we sin willfully against, uh, after, sorry, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for, for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Notice that. We can turn our salvation into a curse. Amen. We can trample underfoot the blood of Christ. Or, and I understand that, you know, we can't literally trample underfoot the blood of Christ. No, we can trample underfoot what the blood of Christ has done for us. Amen. We, if you like, we trample underfoot our own salvation. That's what we do. Amen. That's the danger. Uh, if we lose the want. Amen. So very important that we have this for sure 
definite born again experience. Without that, you have no show. And if you don't have that definite born again experience, but you're here this morning, you're in a good place. Amen? Because you are being enlightened. Amen? You are heading towards and your crisis is coming. Amen? Then when you are born again, because you are born again, you are able to renew your mind. You're able to change your mind. Amen? And of course, it takes discipline. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, when, when I looked at uh, Hebrews chapter 10 there, I thought, well, you know, let me put my spin on what Paul is saying. And uh, um, first of all, uh, you know, obviously, there is no greater curse than being unfulfilled. Who knows what I'm saying? There is no greater curse in your life than being unfulfilled. To be dissatisfied or to feel as though you are useless. Is that true? And some of you may know what I mean and some of you may not because your life is just rosy, rosy, rosy. But true, the curse in human life is feeling disillusioned. Feeling that you serve no good purpose. Amen? Now I thought about that and I thought, well, yes. And I thought, now I see that played around me through, not personally, but through newspapers and, and through news all the time. All the time. You know, you see people who seem to be popular. I mean popular. Stars. You see people who's, who, who, who appear to have everything they want. Everything they want. Anything they want, they can have it there and then. You know, they have men, men some people have, have you know, a wallet full of money. Some people have a wheelbarrow full of money. Some people have truckloads of the stuff. They can get whatever they want anytime. They want to buy a yacht, they buy a yacht. They want to buy a Lamborghini, they go buy a Lamborghini. Amen? You know, they want a new wife, they go buy a new wife or vice versa or whatever. They can get whatever they want because they have everything. Amen? Uh, we, we have, you know, uh, you know uh, we, we, we have people uh, who appear. Let's just get away from that side of the thing. We, we have people all around, and you, and you probably know some people, and they seem to have real purpose in their lives, real drive in their lives. Amen? That they've, they've set their aim for something. But yet, they're unhappy to the point of self-destruction, to the point of harming themselves. You know, they have everything they want. Anything this world can give, they can get. But yet, these very same people, these very same people will harm themselves. They'll drink alcohol to the point of destroying their health. They'll take drugs to the point where it changes, it warps their minds. I mean, they will get on the internet and watch pornography until it completely warps what is natural. They will harm others. They'll harm themselves. They'll even kill themselves. These people who seem to have everything. And they're all around us. Sad thing is that sometimes people model their own lives on their lives. Thinking that they are so successful. Amen. Now in the case of a born again believer. Think about this. To have tasted the goodness of God. To have tasted the goodness of God. And then to turn upon that. Or then not to separate themselves unto God. Is in the exact same place. To the outsider, they look like they have everything. Yeah, they go to church. Amen. They, they speak differently. They behave differently. But the truth is that they're just like the Pharisees. They need to. They don't want to. And so they're most unhappy. 
Most dissatisfied. You know if you're one of them because you're always questioning everything. You think about that for a moment. Why do people question the Word of God? Why do people question the Word of God? Tell me. Yes, because they want to get another slant. That's what they want. They want another slant. I don't like the way that the Word is ministered to me. So if somebody would give me something that's nearer to what I wanted to say, isn't that what they want? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Unless you believe I'm preaching lies. No, but that's just another angle on it that people want to understand also. Sure, but where should you go to understand? To the Bible. Yes, and speak to the minister. Yes, correct. Amen, let's get it straight. Amen. But, then, but invariably people will question because they want some other angle. True? Well, I believe it's that way anyway. Amen. Now, to have tasted the goodness of God and not to separate our life unto Him is to bring a curse. Notice the emphasis here is on life. To separate our life. This is important, isn't it? Our life. See, life is more than just my being. Life is to give my, I'd say everything, but it's, it's, I can't even describe it like that. But to separate my life. Because my life includes not just me, it includes you know, everything around me, uh, family, friends, it includes everything I have. It's yeah, it, 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 it includes you know, what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. It's, some of you understand what I'm saying and some may not, but to separate your life unto God, if we don't separate our life unto God, uh, we, 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 we are in serious trouble, amen? There are many who get saved. There are many who study to renew their minds, but I feel there are only a few who have the discipline to put that in their lives. As most of us feel more comfortable in a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Amen? Let's not go to, to, to extremes, so to speak. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Look, let's, let's turn to 1 Samuel. I feel like I'm... Uh, 1 Samuel 15, sorry. 1 Samuel 15, of course, is, is about Samuel and Saul. And uh, Saul was really, what type of man was he? Huh? What did you say? Well, you know, Saul is a type of the carnal man, isn't he? Amen. Saul worked, lived his life with what he saw, what he heard. And what he perceived was good from, uh, from a human standpoint. Amen? From a human standpoint or, or from an earthy standpoint. Um, so that's kind of how, 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 he, how, he, how he lived his life. Uh, what does it say? 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22. He said, Then said Samuel, Is that the one I wanted? 15? Let me just check. Um, 22. That's the one. I just, I was reading 32, but if you're blind, what can you do? <laughs> and Samuel said, I'm very soon I'll need one of these Bibles that has letters raised up a little bit so I can run my fingers over them. <laughs> and Samuel said, Have the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in the obeying of the voice of the Lord. And that's what we need to consider. 
What pleases God more? That you dress right? That you follow all the outward protocols, so to speak? Or whether you obey the voice of God? And you see, the, 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 the folks can... And, and here's a problem, is it's very hard to see the difference between those who do it because they need to and those who want to. Amen? And so Saul asked, as Samuel asked Saul, yeah, what, what pleases God more? Amen? That all the sacrifice, remember he said, well, he brought the, some of the sheep and the cattle so he could sacrifice to God. Spared the king because he thought it was a humane thing to do. Maybe he was going to torture him later, I don't know. But what did God say? I don't want none of that. Amen? You can't mix that with me. Amen? And when we need to find ourselves in that same place, we need to know whether we're doing something because we need to do it or because we want to do it. Amen? So, when I look at Psalm chapter, or Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, Psalm 1, I see it as, yeah, it's a call to being saved, but it's a call also unto separation. Amen? In fact, I believe that it is a call to live our lives His way. And to live our lives His way, Jesus' way, is life intended. That's what life is meant to be. Whether you believe that or not, but life is meant to be Jesus' way. That's what life, that's what God's intention for us is. All humanity to live Jesus' way. He said, I am the way, the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. So God's intention or salvation, salvation's intention is for you and I to live Jesus' way. Because that is life intended for all of humanity. Why am I here? To live Jesus' way. Amen. Why was I born? To live Jesus' way. Well, why is this? Why is that? It's all so you can live Jesus' way. Amen. Why, why do I have this business? Why do I have this job? Why do I have this money? Why do I have this? To live Jesus' way. And if you're living any other way, you're under the curse. Amen? And that's why you're not happy. And that's why you end up in, in a situation where you feel because you are with the right crowd or you're following what you believe is the right path according to the Bible... Amen, but your heart's not in it, but I need to, I need to. And that's cursed. There's no happiness and there's no fulfillment in that. That's why you feel useless. Amen? Because uselessness is curse. Because you were saved and you have life today, both spiritually and physically, because it's life intended. I mean, that's what God promised. That's what Jesus said. He said, yeah, I come to give you life. Hey Amen. Don't, 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 don't say silly things out of your mouth. If you have life intended, don't say silly things. Well, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know this. I don't. No, you're saying the wrong things. Renew this mind. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the moment. Because else you're going to get yourself in an awkward place, a bad place. Where you find yourself that you need to do it for appearance sake. But in truth, you're dissatisfied in your heart. Amen? Where did that dissatisfaction come from? Well, because you're listening to the wrong mind. You're listening to the wrong people. That's our problem sometimes. We're too busy listening to what other people say. We're too busy listening to our own minds and we should be listening to Christ's mind. And he did not save you to make you useless. Didn't save you to disillusion you. He saved you because your life is now as it is intended to be. True? Amen? 
If you're just saved to, to be here to encourage, that's, isn't that a good thing to do? I tell you what, we make a lot out of, you know, we've got to win souls. How about keeping some souls? That'd be a good thing to do, wouldn't it? Amen? Yeah, some of it makes, makes so much out of things. Uh, you know, be, being uh, able to say, like, 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 like our sisters do on, on a Friday, to be able to say a kind, spiritual word to people, isn't it a good thing? It might, it might not get them saved. But I'll tell you what, it's enlightening them. Amen? Only God can bring the crises, if I can put it that way. Only God can bring the crises. Amen. Sister, if all, the, all God's purpose for you was is, is to look after a couple of children on a Friday afternoon and show them the right way, surely that's a good thing. Surely there's good purpose in doing that. As far as I'm the sitting at home just twiddling your thumb and saying, oh, I wonder what I should be doing. Amen. I just, it's, it's, we, we need to be careful because we curse ourselves through our own mouths. Don't we? Don't we? Blessed, happy, content, satisfied, fulfilled is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Let's go there quickly. Some of you may still be there. Amen. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, that word counsel, what's the word counsel mean? He says, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Yeah? Well, it really means advice, doesn't it? Uh, or plan. It can mean plan as well. But I like what um, uh, the Strongs brings out this. It says purpose. Don't listen to the purpose of the ungodly. And to me that's very important because it seems like on the surface or it can appear that you have a safe person and an unsafe person going in the same direction. On the surface it can appear that way or they are both working to the same end. It can appear that way. But there is a difference in purpose. There's a difference in purpose. God is not against Trevor's business. God is for or against the purpose. If I can get my drift. If you get my drift. Okay? We're talking about purpose. Amen? Purpose. You see, one in his vain attempt or her vain attempt to, uh, 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 to, 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 to please self or to please their family, their husband, their wife, their children, their boss, whoever, amen. You have one person who's like that, and then you have another. The, the other one uh, sees the true reality, the truth. And that they are doing what they're doing to please God. Their purpose is to please God. On the surface to everybody looking, it looks exactly the same. Two people working hard. They appear to be providing well for their house. Amen? Succeeding in what they're doing, but underneath there's a different reason, a different purpose. See, this is where you and I have to be so very careful because we can be taking advice from or receiving the purpose of someone that is completely opposite to the purpose of God. Amen? One works for self, one works for family, one works for the boss, one works for and the other says, what I do and my purpose is to please God. Amen? That is the difference. Amen? Amen? See, it is that when we please God, I think in Revelations uh, uh, um, is it chapter 4 or chapter 5, you know, we, we, we are given the reason why God created. And that was what? That, that He would have pleasure. But I want to tell you something. How can you please God if you're not pleased yourself? How is it possible to please God, to be His pleasure, if we are not in pleasure? Which goes again to this one, doesn't it? If you are not here, 
If you don't have the pleasure of God in you, how can you please Him? True? I just want to make that point. Amen? Now, it is only when we are pleased in God that we have His intended life. Amen? Living Jesus' way is life intended. How should I live my life? Jesus' way. What should I do? Jesus' way. How should I behave? Jesus' way. Well, can I do that? Go Jesus' way. You know, some, sometimes I speak with Eileen about things and I, and I say, can, 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 can you imagine Jesus doing that? Can you imagine Jesus playing that sport? Can you imagine Jesus doing this? And we look dumbfounded at each other and more or less laugh and say, we are doing things that are not Jesus' way. You know, I saw on the internet, uh, um, well, uh, no, I saw it, no, I didn't see it, I, yeah, I did, but it was in the, in, the, in the news that there are now some Pentecostal churches in the States who now believe the way to, to share the gospel is in kick, kickboxing. In kickboxing, two pastors from different churches will go hammer and tongs at each other and bash the living daylights out of each other in the name of Christ. Now, even, I notice that because they, you know, they've got opinions, because you know, it's, it's the world looking at it and mocking, of course. And, and, and here's a guy with a collar on, all right? Someone whom, whom we would call Babylon. And he says, I can't see the love of God in it. The Bible says to love your neighbor. How can you love your neighbor when you're punching the living daylights out of them? In other words, can you see Jesus doing that? You know, did, did he take the boys uh, down to the River Jordan you know, on the banks there and say, now boys, strip off and punch the living daylights out of each other? No. See, we're talking about life intended. Jesus' way. It's talking about discipline. True? And you'll never ever discipline unless you have truly born again. Amen. <laughs> It's just how it is. I said, I only myself, some of you talking about something like that. We just have to laugh. What else can you do? Maybe you're doing something right now that you know that's not what Jesus would be doing. You know, he'd, he'd frown upon that. And he'd ask, What are you doing that for? Where is the purpose in what you're doing? How does that enhance the kingdom? How does that reveal who I am? You know, I can understand Muslims wanting to do all these things and bash the living daylights out of each other. Because most of them are in that kind of sports. Are they? I think they are. Anyway, it's just, you know, it's just, you know I just came across it and I think, I think you even asked Terry about it. And he said it was true. That's what's happening. They're all doing it. Then some of them even have now gyms in their churches to teach all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because it's, you know, remember the states, because remember they used to start with the wrestling and then the power lifting and... <laughs> yeah. Did you read somebody got died recently of that too? <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, look, if we're born again, we have to renew our minds. I think it was uh, uh, Paul who said to Timothy, he said, now Timothy, put away youthful things, put away fleshy lust, put away that which you were. That's what he said. You're not like that anymore. Amen. You now have to walk Jesus' way because that is life intended. That's what we're made to do. You know, some, someone here says, uh, says uh, walk, walk not on the counsel of the ungodly. Nor stand in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Let's look at that for a minute. 
Now, if I don't believe the way a sinner believes, what's, a, what's another word for a sinner? What's, what's a more, a word that really upset them? W- wicked. Yes, wicked. A sinner is a wicked person. True. So, see, sometimes because we are, we are, we're taught to be politically correct, we sometimes forget what a sinner is. It's a wicked person. Why is that person wicked? Because they're going contrary to life and tender. They're going contrary against their creator. God says they're wicked. You were wicked once. Amen? And that's just the truth, isn't it? Now, if you don't believe the way an unbeliever believes, amen, and your way is not their way, and, and, and your place, your dwelling place is not their place, how can they advise you? <clears throat> how can you model your life on them? I mean, and, and look, I, I realise that some of us are in jobs and, and you know, even children have got to be educated. And they're not all educated by Christians. I mean, and some who are educated by Christians are better off going some other place. I mean, there's not a plug for homeschool or anything else because those things are kind of necessary. We've got to learn to read and write. There's not that kind of thing. But when we begin to base our life, that's the life, our purpose, on these people or their books, then we're in danger because we have nothing in common. Because on the, on the surface, it appears like we're going in the exact same direction, but the difference is purpose. They're doing it for a different reason than you. Well, that's how, how, how it should be anyway. Amen? Amen? You see, when you think about it, to accept somebody's advice, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, but what are you doing? When you accept somebody's advice, what are you taking on board? Yes. What else? Their belief. You're taking on board their belief. That's what we do. The moment we take somebody's advice and exercise that advice, we take on their belief. Who knows you need to be careful whose belief you take on? Amen? Sometimes we we, we, kind of need to break these things down so we understand what we're actually doing. And so if we take any advice from anybody for any reason, we need to be slow to weigh up whether that advice means taking upon their belief or does their advice, if you like, uh, add to your belief and your purpose. True, because your purpose is what? It ought to be the kingdom, God. Amen? Living Jesus' way. Life intended. Yeah, I, I've no doubt. You know, there, there are people out in the world who can, you know, give us something, uh, uh, what we could call a nugget, or some advice that is inherently not bad. It only becomes a bad thing when you accept that advice and it makes you go. You know, it, uh, it encourages your lust, your carnality, amen. Your craving for the things of this world. I'm going to put it that way. Uh, then you've taken on somebody's, the world's belief. But it is, if, if it is to build your job, build your education, build your business for your purpose, which is God's purpose, understand the difference, all right? We're talking about life, life, amen? You know, we, we need people sometimes to help us, uh, you know, in, in education and training. But don't get wrong. Don't get me wrong. Um, um, amen. I'm just speaking on issues of life. Because our life must be Jesus' way. So any advice we receive that's contrary to that, we should throw it away. Amen. Now, the next one is interesting. It says, uh, um, Nor standeth in the way of sinners. What does that bring to mind? What, what do you think? 
standeth in the way of sinners. Yeah, could do. But, you know, uh, you'll find that uh, every day you're keeping company with sinners. So it can't be that. You know, in your shop, there's sinners all around. So, so it can't be that one. Huh? Yeah, it could be, I think. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty close, isn't it? So, following their path? Huh? Yeah. So, so how, we, how, how would we say that, or could we say that, that the second thing here is to deal with behaviour? The way we behave. We ought not to behave the way sinners behave. Could, could that be kind of what, what the psalmist there is, 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 is trying to tell us? We ought not to live our lives or behave like the wicked. As Paul had to instruct Timothy again, he said, Now Timothy, put away your youthful lusts. Grow up. Don't just grow up in a human way. Grow up as a spiritual man. Because what you once did as a human man or a human youth... You no longer do in Christ because it's not Jesus' way. Amen? Amen? You see, it's, look, it doesn't matter how good you think you were when you were unsaved. It doesn't matter how good things were or how wonderful you thought you were as a person. It was no good. That's just it. It was no good. Yeah, I don't know about you, but um, I don't know where it's, whether it's old timers or, or just God <laughs> or a combination of both. But I remember very little about before I was saved now. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about not so much, okay, yeah, I remember my history, but the way I felt. The life itself. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah, true. yeah I, I remember being drunk and I remember all those things, but, 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 but the life part of that is gone. As I said, I don't know whether that's old timers or that's the grace of God. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I mean as an unsafe person, I think I did some good things too. I'm pretty sure I did. I wasn't just all bad in, 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 in my own eyes. I thought I did some good things. But you know what? They just, <laughs> I don't know, I couldn't name them. It can only be that God is telling me they were no good. They didn't measure. True, they did not measure. Amen? Because they were not. None of them were in his way. They were not life intended. Amen? Remember Jesus said, I am the way. And I certainly was not going his way. If any man be in Christ, he's a... And what's passed away? Old things are passed away. Old things are... It's, it's not just passed away like, uh, like, like the wind passed us. That word passed away there is like death. Okay, it means death. They are now dead to me. And that's what Paul tries to explain to us in Philippians chapter 2 or 3. You know, when uh, he talked about his past life being dung. Did he say dung? Yeah, you know, uh, he, you know in, in a sense, you know, obviously Paul did some good things before he was saved. Did some bad things too, no doubt. Amen. And, and, and uh, in, in, in the uh, ordinary, we're not discounted all dung like he did. But he said the reason that they were not right is because they were not Jesus' way. They were not done in Christ. That made them worthless because they were not life intended. Amen? So, so he says here, if any man be in Christ, he's a... If any man is in blessedness, he's a... If any man is contented, he is... If any man is satisfied, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
Amen? So we decided that, that um, the way of sinners, or standing in the way of sinners, it's got to do with behaviour. And then, and then the last one was what? And sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, of course we could go to and, and identify all those words and decide what they are and what's a scorner and what's not a scorner. And boy, we could become Pharisees. Uh, but when I'm sitting somewhere, what am I, what's the statement I'm making? Yes, I belong. True, I belong. That's what he's really saying. When you sit down, you are saying, I belong. Amen? I belong. You see, true believers who renew their mind, do they belong with the wicked? No. <laughs> Amen? Why? Because we have no common ground. None whatsoever. There is no common ground, not one bit of common ground, because if there was common ground, Paul would not have said, old things have passed away. He said, some old things have passed. He would not have counted his whole unsaved life as being done. He says, well, you know, that was rubbish and that was rubbish. Hey, that wasn't too bad. So, in that sense, you have nothing in common. Nothing with an unsafe person because they don't live life and death. They don't live Jesus' way. You may do both the same things, but again, there's two different purposes. It might appear to everybody else that you're doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, you know, Trevor's got the same building design business as Joe Bloggs down the street. They're doing the same thing. They're designing houses. You know, driving Volkswagens and what have you and look like they're living high off the hog. But the truth is that they are completely different. One is doing it to live high off the hog. The other is doing it because God's purpose. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm, what I'm, you know, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Somebody quickly get up, grab that for me. Somebody might know it off by heart. And we shall get to the end. Very quickly now. Wherefore, Wherefore if any, what? Come out, from uh, come out from among you and be... Separate from what? <laughs> Separate from what? See, the, see, this is the thing, isn't it? Because people read these scriptures, and we can go, you know, down the street, around the corner, and go, go to that place there, and read the scriptures. So, what? Separate from what? And and the, you know, the, they would hum and har and spit and carry on and, and try and work it so they can continue to do what they do. We're to be separate from who? From the wicked. From darkness. From the purpose of the world. And we can be because we've been born again. We can be because in new birth... There is now a power to help us change our minds. We're now able to see, if you like, we're now able to see what is going on behind the temporal, behind the physical, behind what looks the same. I think I said a few weeks ago now, I believe Paul had the ability to be able to see no matter what physical thing came before him, he knew what was going on behind it. He knew the spiritual reality. I mean, the only reason that caused him not to complain and to bicker and so forth, you know, when he was beaten up, you know, shipwrecked, thrown in prison, there's only one reason he could bear all that because he knew, not guessed, he knew the reality behind all that. And that's what we have to gain. That discerning spirit to be able to see what is happening behind every physical thing that's going around us. Because only then can we love our neighbour. 
Only then can we look behind some vile act. True? And continue to love the human being. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? Sounds horrible. But yet God has put something within us to be able to look beyond that and realise that there's a power loosed upon the earth that it causes people to do vile and horrible things. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let us finish with Lot as our example. Now Lot is an amazing man. Who remembers Lot? Abraham's, what was he, Abraham's nephew, was it nephew? Something like that anyway. And yet the amazing thing about Lot is this, is when Abraham got the call from God to leave, was it Ur, in Babylon there, or, or in, Iraq, in Iraq there, uh, that area there, um, when, when uh, Abraham received the call from God to do that, Lot did the same. Lot gave everything up, all the familiarity, everything, and he said, Abraham, I'm going with you. Amen. Just as Abraham went by faith, following the Lamb wheresoever he goeth, Lot did exactly the same thing. Amen. They were kind of like a, a pair. But something happened when they reached what we could call the Promised Land or Palestine. Something changed. Amen. Something changed. You see, one, his name was Abraham, or was it Abram at the time? He looked at this barren land, and it was dry. <laughs> And of course Stephen got stoned for it when Stephen said that um, Abraham did not set foot on the land that God promised. And of course the Pharisees killed him for that. See when Abraham reached there he, he continued to look because he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham knew when he'd reached that place, that was not the place. It was just a type of the place. But Lot was different. You see, when Lot reached there, what did Lot see? Lot stopped looking for the spiritual land, the spiritual home, the, the city that God is a builder of and began to look at the temporal things. Amen. He, maybe he was an astute businessman. I don't know. He started looking for where's the best place to, to make a crust. Remember, Abraham gave him the choice. Hey, he said, he said Lot, you know, we're, we're, we're growing, we're growing, growing. You choose. And you, 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 you choose first and I'll go the opposite way. Amen. Of course, what did Lot do? He thought he'd choose the best. Amen. He thought, he thought he'd choose the best. Amen. Now you can read about that in, in, um, in Genesis chapter 13. I, I won't do it now because we're kind of running out of time. But Genesis 13, you know, 10 through... Oh, the, come on, the roast can wait. <laughs> Genesis 13, only a couple of verses. You see, Lot saw the land and its attributes... And look at what he said. He said this in, 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 verse, in, in verse 10. It says, uh, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, and that it was well watered everywhere before, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest out of Soar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the, of course, the, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord very much. <laughs> Exceedingly, it says, doesn't it? Amen? Now, 
First of all, be careful to whom you look. <laughs> Amen? You see, when we go to the next chapter, now I'm not going to read the next chapter, but we see something astounding in Lot's life. The man who followed the Lamb, wheresoever he goeth, travelled all the way from what we call Iraq today, all the way by foot to where we envisage Israel is today, not knowing where he was going, just like they had no idea where they were going. They just followed the Lamb. Amen? You think uh, upwards and upwards, upwards, upwards. But that man went from that and began a huge spiral downward. Amen? The first thing he does is what? He separates from Abraham and then he does what? He sets his tents. He's still in tents. He sets his tents towards Sodom. So that's the thing. You better watch, careful what you watch. Amen? He wasn't in the city yet, but he set his tent, not backward, but facing Sodom. Amen? And then if you look in the next chapter, next thing you see him in his house, in Sodom. True? You see, Lot may not have been a Sodomite, I don't believe he was. But he looked upon them and he began to approve of them. Get the picture. Be careful what you look at. Because if you look at it long enough, you'll become approving of it. Amen? This is Psalm 1. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You see, when you judge sin righteous, or if you're silent over its action, you judge it right. You find that in Romans chapter 2, I, I think. You see, when you look upon sin and for convenience, look over it. Isn't that, what, isn't that what Lot did? Lot, Lot did this. And some of us are guilty of this. As we see people around us doing things not Jesus' way. And we look over it for convenience sake. And we're just like Lot. We have set our tent towards Sodom. The problem is that when you overlook these things, God says to us, you judge it right. And even though you are not a sodomite, you have in fact become a sodomite. If I can put it in that way. Amen? And thus, what do we see the final downward spiral of Lot? We see him in his house in the city. Or as we read in Psalm chapter 1, verse, sorry, Psalm 1, verse 1, he belonged. He belonged. He belonged. Amen? Amen? I tell you what, I think it's a little leaven <laughs> destroys the whole lump. Amen? You a little, little bit of leaven in, sister? It will grow and grow and grow until you are leavened. It's just how it is. Let's just finish with um, Isaiah 31. Just want to, just this is it. Time is up. The roast is calling. You can hear it. Isaiah 31. And verse 1. Woe unto them that go down to Egypt for help. And stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many. And in horsemen 
because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Yet he's also, yet he also is wise and will bring evil and will not call back his words, but will arise against the horse of the evildoers, against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men. Now the Egyptians are men and not, and not God. You know, Eli, Eli, Eli Hugh, I think it is, is it Eli, Eli who? The guy who spoke to, um, to Job. Who remembers what his name was? I'm just guessing now. And remember, Job couldn't figure out why everything was happening the way it was going. And so uh, he gave him some advice. And then, you know, because uh, you know, Job was just, you know, I don't know, maybe he was just spiraling out of, he said, Job, you just got to sit down for a minute. Let me just give you some advice. Amen. He said this, he said, I will answer thee that God is greater than man. That God is greater than man. Amen? Think upon that. Be careful where you belong. Because what you look to is where you end up. That's why our call is always to look to heaven. Look to heaven. Look to Jesus. Go Jesus' way. Because it's almost like there's a principle or a law at work that ensures that's where you will end up. In my house are many mansions. <laughs> but you get my drift. You get my drift. Yeah, we could use many examples. Look at, look at Jacob. Yeah, when, when he wanted to steal, sorry, not steal, borrow some of Laban's flock. Amen. At the, at the drinking troughs, he, he had these striped sticks. And as they looked upon them, day in, day out, every drink looked upon them. <laughs> well, that's how they became. Well, that's how their offspring became. Be careful what you look to. Be careful whose advice you take. Be careful how you behave. Because it all leads to where you belong. Amen. Like I said, we, we can go into all the Hebrew meanings of all those words in Psalm 1 verse 1. We don't have to. We don't have to. Praise the Lord. I hope you got something from that this morning. I hope it was good for you. Amen. I hope it was just a further enhancement from last week. And uh, it is an encouragement to you, not a discouragement. Amen. And if you are discouraged, look upon it as a blessing. Hey, you're being enlightened. Your day is nearing. The crisis is coming. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord.